All right, there we go. We are recording. So again, good afternoon. Happy Sunday. Welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society's second online lecture, Great Storms of the Jersey Shore with Scott Mazella and Margaret Buckles. I will be your host for today. My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am a trustee of the Ocean County Historical Society. We have a number of other trustees here on the recording today, so welcome to all of them. And thanks especially to our president, Brian Bavasso, who would usually give you a wonderful welcome to the Historical Society if we were there in person, but he has deputized me to do that today. Um, and also our programs committee who works so hard behind the scenes to get these programs together. Um, to include Barbara Roish and Mickey and Richard Kuntz. So thanks to everybody who put this together. Um, just a note that today's program is being recorded. So if you want to turn your camera off or if that concerns you in any way, um, please consider yourself warned. We will be posting this talk on our YouTube channel to stay up to date on all the latest Ocean County Historical Society news be sure to follow us on the social media of your choice. We now have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. So uh, don't miss out on any of our future programs or our fundraising efforts because we are an all volunteer historical society and every donation matters. So thank you all for being here. Brian, I can see you. Um, did I miss anything? We're good? All right, then let's dive into the show with again, thank you so much, Scott and Margaret. All right, thanks. Hi, hi everybody. I hope everybody's doing good out there wherever you are. Um, we're all getting used to these Zoom meetings. It's uh, pretty cool. I'm a seventh grade teacher in Old Bridge, so I'm doing this every day now, except I, I'm pretty sure you guys will be a better audience than my 12 year old seventh graders. But if anyone has to go to the bathroom, just raise your hand and uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you know. Just kidding. Um, all right, so welcome. Um, today we're going to be talking about Great Storms of the Jersey Shore, which is uh, Margaret and I, we, it's our book. Uh, this book actually goes back to, all the way to 1993. It was actually a book I had as a teenager. Uh, other kids were reading uh, graphic novels and comics. I was reading Great Storms of the Jersey Shore. And a couple years ago, I was offered an opportunity to update it. Um, and the result is the second edition of Great Storms, which uh, is out now. Um, so thank you for being here. I hope uh, you find it interesting. Um, I'm going to start things off and hopefully this will, uh, there we go. I want to start things off just talking about how fascinated people are with storms. Um, no matter where you go, a storm will stop most people in their tracks. To, some people like to look at it. Some people head for the hills. Some people bury themselves in a closet because uh, they're scared of it. But people are often very cognizant and aware and in awe of storms. Uh, this was a storm on your screen a couple summers ago, which thanks to social media appeared everywhere. It was a shelf cloud from a storm over Northern Long Beach Island. Um, and probably, I think it was uh, over Island Beach State Park as well. But this, this particular shelf cloud grabbed a lot of social media attention because, because people are just enamored with storms. And uh, we could go back all the way um, to colonial times and read several very vivid accounts of storms from our founding fathers. Um, even during the age of the enlightenment, thunderstorms uh, fascinated Alexander Hamilton and Ben Franklin and those guys too. So weather's always been a big, big part of uh, our human experience. And uh, if you look past the destruction in a lot of pictures, um, which certainly the destruction is what grabs you, you will often see people in these pictures and the reactions to, to the weather or the situation or the damage uh, can be almost as gripping as uh, the damage behind them. Like this little girl, what's her story? You know, uh, did her grandfather just lose her ha their beach house or their, uh, did something happen to a family member? We don't know, but you could see the pain on her face. And every storm that uh, you could research has these kind of images. Um, sometimes they're playful, like uh, the gentleman standing in the floodwaters. Other times they're just dramatic, uh, like the woman with the battleship uh, USS Monson uh, on the LBI. And then on the lower left, you see a man crying. He just as, He just found out his house was completely washed out to sea. There's some curiosity. 
there's just some smiling like, oh, it's another storm. Uh, today with the value of homes being so high, storms could be devastating financially to people if they don't have insurance. Back in the day, while that was probably still true, uh, houses were not as uh, always as luxurious or big or, or what have you. A buddy of mine who never updates his house, his house dates back to the 44 hurricane. He always says he, he doesn't want to update it because he knows another storm's coming and he'll just keep it fixable so he can just replace it when things happen. Um, so, but of course the short today is quite built up. I'll talk about more about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so the risk of living down the shore is that you have to face storms, whether they're nor'easters or hurricanes, tropical storms. Uh, if you're gonna have a home at the shore, you have to accept the risk. But why do we do that? Well, because the reward is so immensely great, right? Um, there are far more great days at the beach than disastrous days at the beach. And it's worth that risk for millions of Jersey Shore goers. All right, so at this point in the presentation, oh, I forgot, I have another slide. <laughs> I was gonna throw it to Margaret, but I'm, I'm not quite ready there. Um, this graphic was done for us by Brian McNulty at the University of Miami, um, which illustrates the most impactful hurricanes to come close or to impact the Jersey Shore. Um, all of these had impacts um, in terms of uh, affecting the people at the shore, uh, some far more than others. Uh, you can see most tropical systems and hurricanes pass offshore. Um, the Outer Banks typically blocks us from uh, significant impacts. And for uh, pretty much you know, 50 years, we had no major impacts. We had experiences, but no major, major issues until uh, Sandy came along. And I bet you could pick out which one Sandy is. Sandy was such an outlier compared to the rest. Sandy came in, there she is going perpendicular to shore, the worst case scenario. Uh, but even like the hurricane of 44, which is far offshore, had major and devastating impacts to the Jersey shore. And, it, and its center, of, the center of that storm was far offshore. <clears throat> Tropical storm Isaias, or Isaias, I always say Isaias, Isaias. That one didn't even come on shore in New Jersey and impacted New Jersey greatly this past summer. Uh, millions were without electricity for days, um, even though the shore wasn't as impacted as much. I'll get more into the, the 50 years of, or plus of storms, actually more, far more than that, over a century of storms uh, in a little bit. Um, but first I wanted to throw it to Margaret, for real this time, who's gonna go over some of New Jersey's most historic storms. Okay, this one looks like 1944, right? Yep, it's just the intro slide. So let me advance it. Well, that's what I wanted to say was um, that I I lived out the shore my whole life, and I've experienced many of these storms from 1938 to 1944 to 1962, and I was evacuated in as a baby in 1935, and again evacuated in 1944. And uh, so that's sort of my initial interest. And I also like research. So when we started this book, I did the research everywhere from Library of Congress up to the uh, police headquarters in Trenton for photos, Philadelphia, New York, and all the historical societies up and down the coast. I spent quite a bit of time at Ocean County. And uh, 1889, this is before photographs. We had qu this quite a bad storm then. And these are Harper's Magazine's illustration, this one and the one before. And this one. But people always rebuilt. Atlantic, this is the first Atlantic City boardwalk or what was left of it from that same 1889 storm. And Atlantic City then continued to build boardwalks and I think the current one is number four. Next. Those are the uh, railroad tracks coming down to the northeast corner of Barnegat Light. There was a winter storm, 1919, 1920. This house was moved back two times and I just heard recently that it was just demolished 
several months ago. But uh, this storm was very bad on the north end of Long Beach Island. That's the same house in 38. The boardwalk again in Bayhead in 1929. The boardwalks were sort of made the uh, made these resorts what they were and brought people down to walk on the boardwalk to see the ocean. Every town had one. This was a major hurricane. Scott said it went offshore by about 40 miles. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, this one's in Keensburg. And this is up near, I think, where it was a lot of damage in Sandy. Well, Scott will talk about that later. I met a man in Atlantic City. I interviewed him who told me about how they rescued people with a Coast Guard breaches buoy, shooting it out from one side on the left to the other side to haul the people back in who were stranded on the end of Heinz Pier. And you see what's left of the boardwalk there in Atlantic City in 1944 storm. They had a major storm surge. They called them tidal waves back then, but they were actually the storm surge that came in. It was estimated 12 feet, 15 feet, 40 feet at around 5.30 in the afternoon. Next one. Monmouth County boardwalk again. Beach Haven decided not to rebuild its boardwalk. They sold their lumber to Atlantic City for the Atlantic City's rebuilding. And all this area you see now here is dunes and development. Nineteen forty four again. Several people were killed down here, uh, washed away. There's a great story in there about how the Coast Guard were rescuing these people as they climbed, swam from one house to another, held on to wreckage, climbed up into the houses, got out the windows again, then were washed away. Fascinating. One of the things that makes this book so interesting are the personal stories. I interviewed so many people uh, and got so many different points of view. This is my town and right up there at the top is my house where I'm sitting now. It's still just as low and just as close to the uh, water. We had uh, about four inches in here on Sandy, but I'm still here. This is Harvey, uh, yeah, obviously it says that, okay. This was a three day nor'e nor'easter. They had uh, six or seven high tides. And after each high tide, the bay filled up and it never washed out again. So the next wave, the next high tide washed away more and then washed away more. And it continued for how many days, Scott? Two, two days. Three days in total. But... Three days, yeah. Uh, I was living in Philadelphia then. My father was mayor here, and uh, it was pretty awful. This is um, 79th Street. It broke through there, and it broke through the other end of Harvey Cedars and down and past Beach Haven. Thanks. That's all water you see beyond that building, in the one, but it's not originally all water. It was all land at the top, and then there was a cove house floating in the middle. People in Harvey Cedars evacuated to the Bible Conference, which is a 19th century hotel, very high, and about 50 people took refuge in there for several days. And actually one of the photos taken from the Bible Conference was used on the uh, fall issue in 1962 of National Geographic magazine. Next. Another shot from the same point of view. This is all solid houses now. That's the inlet after the storm receded. 
and all the houses you see in the left uh, near the water were demolished, torn down, rebuilt. My father came in with his dredge immediately after, as soon as they could, and started filling in this uh, inlet. My, my brother was running the dredge then, and my father, as the mayor, had gone into uh, Philadelphia to talk to the Corps of Engineers about getting help here as fast as possible. Gone. Oh, that's my father, and that's the inlet looking toward the town. The roof on the left was a shop called Sink or Swim, and they never came back to Harvey Cedars again. This is the uh, south end of town. You see the house out there in the water. A bunch of boys who lived in the neighborhood. It was still there on 4th of July and they set it on fire. That was the celebration for the town that year. The Army Corps came in very quickly and started um, bulldozing a lot, uh, the, the road, the main road in so people could get in, the trucks and people who were working there could get in. I had been in Philadelphia and came down and met my father on the bridge and the state police took us back in. They got us about this far, then we had to walk the rest of the way. Okay. It wasn't just the ocean, it was the bayside. They gathered up some of these wrecked cars and put them along the ocean eventually. I think that was 62, yes, and built sand on top of them to help build up the dunes. Back to Holgate again. Holgate is rebuilt after every storm when it shouldn't have, but Scott will talk more about that. A couple of shots from along the ocean. You notice the houses that weren't wrecked were on pilings. This is a house on uh, the President of American Express's um, estate. It went from the ocean to the bay, and this was his oceanfront house. And this is the house where I was taken to by the Coast Guard as a baby in the 1935 Northeaster because it was considered safe. It survived in 1944, but in 62, all the houses went. After the officials saw what had happened in this storm and how the pilings work, after that, all houses had to be built on pilings and had to be at a certain elevation, which explains how much the character of the island and a lot of the shore areas has changed as the houses are bigger and higher. Next. The Atlantic City Electric Company sent men down to try to see what they could do about the electric wires, but they couldn't get, that's what happened to them. The two men in there were saved by a couple of boys from Harvey Cedars, teenagers, who helped them get to the Bible conference in safety. The electric company also took a lot of these photos. Okay. This is an interesting house when you see the next slide. It just tore down on one side, and there are still things on the shelf where it survived in the middle there. This is an old house in Harvey Cedars where I live. The old, the old, uh, this is the cover of the self cover book, right? I don't think it's this one. She's, it's the same woman, but it's a different picture. Yeah, her husband took a lot of pictures up and down the island. Yeah. This ship was being towed. This destroyer was being towed uh, during the storm. And 
the line broke and it washed up in Holgate. It took them several months to dig it out and tow it away again. Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, this picture is kind of dear to me because um, that is my parents' staircase to their house. They didn't own it, uh, the house back in 62. The house itself is right uh, behind there. Um, can you guys see my cursor moving too? I'm not, oh, you yes. can. Okay, I wasn't sure yeah. if you could see that. Yeah. Um, so this staircase was attached to the side of this house. The staircase stayed and the house went. But I was at a talk before I uh, wrote any books. I was at a talk that uh, Margaret was giving and this picture popped up and I nearly jumped out of my seat. I'm like, that's our house, that's my house. He, he did jump out of his seat. I did, I, I couldn't <laughs> hold everything. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, was so excited to see that. I've been enamored with uh, coastal storms since I was a kid. I used to go into the basement. We actually had a basement. Whoever put this house back, all they did was build it up a couple cinder blocks higher than it used to be. I guess they were grandfathered in from the uh, pile uh, regulation. Uh, but I used to go in the basement, sandy floor basement, and look at the crack beams. They would just put a beam next to it, a new beam, and the crack beams were still down there. And I was just always uh, fascinated with the 62 storm. There, it, my parents' block, this is our block, Jacklin Avenue in Holgate, which is the southern end of Long Beach Island. You can't even see the roads, but you can kind of get an inkling of which direction they go. This was uh, Jacklin Avenue, and the boulevard would go this way. Uh, but this is the staircase right here, and that's their house. So everything got swished around. Um, I think I have a closer picture, yeah. So uh, you can see the pad and the staircase and the house went, but they put it back. Uh, in fact, most of these houses are still here, even after Sandy. Uh, we have a very, a very original block, which is very cool. All right, so after 1962, um, like Margaret was saying, everything uh, was rebuilt and Holgate was rebuilt, even though there were, there were people who thought Holgate should not be rebuilt because it's in such a perilous location. But we had about 50 years of not storm-free time, but no massive 62 storm-like event. I know some of you remember uh, some of the storms between 62 and Sandy. Of course, they came and went, but nothing quite to the level of 62. Uh, which meant you had about 50 years of development going on, which crammed every uh, house into every last bit of real estate uh, there is on the Jersey Shore. Uh, but also you have a couple generations of people coming in who have no experience or any clue as to the danger of these massive storms pose. Uh, you have nor'easters that happen in the winter and they could be just as concerning if not more concerning than hurricanes a lot of the times, but we have, even to this day, you could talk to people at the shore who have no clue about just how dangerous these storms are. And the houses are getting uh, bigger and more expensive uh, to this day um, with no insight. insight. Um, that's gonna play into uh, Sandy qu quite a, a lot. So here we have some significant storms between 62 and Sandy. Um, you had Bell in 76 and Gloria um, and Charlie and Bob. I remember working, I was a beat beach checker uh, as a, I think I was 13 or 14. They still made us check beach badges on that day when Bob came through because the sun came out and they're like, people are on the beach. They were in the dunes. They weren't on the beach, but we had to go check badges in the dunes, which I thought was crazy. Floyd, I remember, because I tried to, uh, bodyboard that with my buddies. I almost drowned. Um, and Irene, of course, in 2011 was our big dress rehearsal for Sandy, but no one realized that at the time. Um, in fact, it was that storm that kind of put some people in danger in, during Sandy because they remembered Irene coming and going without much fuss at the shore. It caused a great deal of problems inland and in North Jersey, but a lot of people had what I call the Irene effect before Sandy. Um, in terms of uh, nor'easters, anyone who's at the shore is familiar with nor'easters. Uh, one significant one was the 1991 perfect storm, which thankfully, um, while it did damage at the shore, the bulk of it, bulk of the damage is north of us 
and the center of it was always out to sea from us. Um, Sandy was like the perfect storm, except it was traveling right towards us, which made all the difference there. Um, here's the Halloween storm, 1991. You see the massive amount of water up on the uh, Longport uh, oceanfront. Here's uh, the 92 nor'easter, December, strong enough to uh, remove the roof from this home. They can show off their nice candy striped furniture. Uh, Cape May, um, not Venice, Italy, Cape May. Uh, you can see the nice uh, Victorians here and, and flooding going on there in the winter of 1991 and 92. So nor'easters are a part of our life at the shore. Then came Irene. Irene, if you recall, was supposed to be the game changer. Uh, and that's mostly because of media. Media was everywhere. They, they had I remember helicopters flying over. They were just like itching the show, like what the storm could do. And it, it worked in terms of getting people to evacuate. I think you remember the get the hell off the beach, right? The governor said and, and all that. Um, so we were all kind of bracing ourselves and, and Irene came right up and she weakened, um, she made landfall near Brigantine and went right up the parkway and into New York City. And at the shore, the damage was minimal, uh, but up in North Jersey, the rain caused a lot of problems. So uh, that's Irene. And then this is Sandy, just to illustrate the difference. Sandy came perpendicular to shore, which that changes the entire game. Uh, when I used to go, again, as a teenager, I would go to the Army Corps of Engineer presentations uh, at the Foundation of Arts and Sciences in Love Ladies. And they would always say the worst case scenario is a perpendicular hit. But then they always said this caveat, uh, they would say, well, we don't have to worry about that because the, the outer banks always block us from any big things and they almost always go offshore. And Sandy was the one, <laughs> the worst case scenario. Uh, in fact, the, when the models started to show this, um, about 10 days out, the Euro model was starting to show this. Um, it got a lot of weather geeks like me very excited, but a lot of people just brushed it off as just a model that wasn't going to happen. But this kind of low center, low pressure um, at 956 millibars heading towards the coast is a, is a problem. Um, Sandy was both a powerful hurricane and did a lot of damage in the Caribbean but then she was also a very powerful hybrid storm um, as she stopped for the most part being a tropical system, her warm core being replaced by a cold core. Uh, she was a massive system. At one point her cloud canopy was over a thousand miles. If you remember right before Sandy, uh, it was cloudy. A lot of times with hurricanes, it's sunny the day before, uh, but with Irene or Sandy, it was cloudy because she had such a huge cloud canopy. And that's because she was weakening as a hurricane. And when a hurricane weakens, it kind of, the cloud canopy and the wind uh, field expands as it weakens, kind of unwinds itself. And that's what Sandy was doing. And then what happened, there was a low pressure system over the Ohio River Valley that kind of was absorbing that energy and spinning her up again. And uh, she, she might've been a weakening hurricane, but then she became a very powerful nor'easter type storm except she had nowhere to go. There's a high pressure block near to the east and that low to the west. And she had like, kind of like stuck between the bowling ball return, you know, and the tires in the bowling ball return, shoot out the ball. They shot out Sandy uh, right into, again, Brigantine, uh, uh, that area. So the center came in right here. And uh, unlike a hurricane, which would have localized damage around the center, because she had an expanding wind field, you had a, a massive wind field over a huge fetch of sea that was pushing all that energy right into the Jersey Shore, right into Raritan Bay, right into New York Harbor, right around Long Island. And instead of being a disaster right around Brigantine and probably LBI, it became a disaster for most of the Jersey Shore and a huge part of uh, the Long Island coast and even up to Connecticut and Rhode Island, which is incredible. So for those people who, who went through Sandy, um, I'll get more, I'll tell you more, a couple of those stories in a second, but 
I didn't see any of the damage from Sandy for days because we had no power for two weeks. And uh, I was trying to get internet. It, was, it wasn't like today. Everything's a, a little bit uh, better in terms of technology. But um, when, I, when I finally saw these images, this iconic image of the roller coaster in the ocean in Seaside Heights, the Jetstar roller coaster. I mean, that was worldwide news. Um, people were fascinated uh, with seeing a roller coaster like that. It looks like a giant shark just bit the end of this uh, pier. Uh, the amusement pier here. Uh, people had never seen anything like this. Uh, it's quintessential Jersey boardwalk scene, but to be destroyed in such a manner was just riveting to see and just really drove home how bad this was. Um, Pooch was, or Margaret was talking about um, Harvey Cedars a lot in 1962. If the 62 storm was Harvey Cedars uh, storm or if Harvey, Harvey Cedars was ground zero in 62, then Manilokin was pretty much ground zero uh, for Sandy. I mean, this, you guys know Manilogan, you have this, the Ocean County um, Historical Association. This is not far from, uh, you know, even Monmouth or <laughs> New York, but we all saw the pictures after Sandy of this bridge to nowhere, right? Like this bridge into this inlet where there were mansions. If you know Manilogan and Bayhead, I mean, the houses are massive million dollar homes and, and they're, they're wiped out. In Great Storms, we detail a story about the police chief, the acting police chief, uh, who had evacuated the police station up this road at the top to the tow boat US um, building. And they wrote it out after seeing some of the damage it was doing to the oceanfront homes. He called all the officers out and they were gonna, uh, they took note of every person who was still in town so they could go back and check on them when they could. And in the middle of the night, they saw all these fire trucks and policemen coming towards the bridge. And they were like, why are they going there? That's our town. And when they went up this bridge, the officer was telling me, and it's much more detailed in the book, but basically he, he couldn't see any houses. And he looked out and he was, his heart sank because he, he wasn't even sure if his town existed. He was acting police chief of a town he wasn't even sure existed anymore. Uh, and as they're up there looking at this, a house hit the bridge. They had to evacuate off the bridge. And then the, when he was able to finally go there and take pictures, he, uh, he took pictures, he took this picture. Um, this was a pretty famous house after the storm. How did this house make it? Uh, that owner of that house was smart enough to build on a slightly higher piece of land and uh, it survived the storm. And that house is still there today. Although you wouldn't recognize it from this picture because this is all road now, it's all fixed and it's house, 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 you know? just like everywhere else on the shore. Uh, but it's still there if you look close. Here are two more houses that were up against the bridge, just obliterated. And poor Manilokin had two inlets. This is another inlet that broke through in that, in that town as well. So there were two instances of, of water breakthrough. And actually, if I go back, someone told me uh, there used to be an inlet here a long time ago. So. Oftentimes mother nature in these storms wants to put inlets back where they were. I mean, there was a reason they were there in the first place. And we just build and pave over it. But like I said before, the reward part is what makes us do it. But we have to deal with this from, from time to time. Here's the Ocean Grove Fishing Pier. During the storm, I, that whole building and most of that boardwalk was gone after the storm. This was the book, uh, the cover of uh, my first book, Surviving Sandy showing the block next to my parents. Remember that other one I showed you before, the black and white? Well, this was after Sandy, and this is about four feet of sand. And all these oceanfront homes, because the boulevard went like this. If you've been to Holgate or any oceanfront in Long Beach Island, you know that most of them have driveways that ramp up into a garage, and this is all covered. Um, the ocean just blew out all the bottoms of those ocean fronts, and then took the contents and tossed them and then shoved all that beach sand west. And uh, this was the uh, result. And just like uh, his father did, uh, Mayor Mancini, whose father was mayor of Long Beach Township in 62, he said he remembered his father ordering all these ocean fronts to be cross braced after the storm because he was afraid they were gonna teeter over. Well, Mayor Man Mancini did that again after uh, Sandy. This car, by the way, was in one of the oceanfront homes, but off the screen. 
That's one of their homes. Every time I see a Volvo like this, I think of this cover. Sorry, Volvo, I hope they don't come after me. <laughs> um, Charlie Potter uh, was an employee who worked at the Seashell Motel in Beach Haven. And uh, he took refuge there and he and the, the bartender were doing some last minute checking behind the bar and uh, the storm surge came through from Sandy and uh, just wiped out the glass wall and pinned Charlie under a beer cooler that was full in this wreckage in the middle of this. And water was washing over him and he, had, he was worried about his life and the other bartender was caught too. The fire department was staying across the street at the Angleside Motel and they came over and they cut up part of the bar and got him out. But he was worried he was gonna have his ankle cut off. He was just like, take the ankle, I don't care, get me out of here. They, they got him out without any problem. And he was not injured and he kept his ankle. Um, probably the most iconic image from Sandy that appeared on many, I mean, I said the roller coaster was probably the most iconic. There's a lot of those. Um, <laughs> the other most iconic uh, photo from Sandy is this one from Union Beach. This is a Bayshore town, a blue collar Bayshore town of year round residents who face flooding in certain kinds of storms and expected flooding, but because of the, the wind field blowing the way it was and the fact that water was now being blown in from the, from the ocean into the harbors, all that water had nowhere to go, but right into Union Beach and um, Leonardo and uh, the western part of Sandy Hook and Cliffwood Beach, Lawrence Harbor, Keensburg, those kind of places, Keyport. But this was Union Beach and it just ripped apart this house. If you look closely up here, there's still clothes hanging on the clothes on the uh, on the curtain, uh, the closet rack. See that dress there? Um, oh, yeah. It was just incredible how a storm can do that. There's, Margaret could probably tell you too, there's some pictures in great storms of people who's, who lost a whole room from their house, but all the china is perfectly stacked in the cabinets. Uh, it's funny how these storms Oh, that work. one's from 1944 where the yeah, house 44. broke in the kitchen, yeah. Yeah, she's like looking at, all the china was perfectly fine. Yeah. It was outside, but it was perfectly fine. That one made the Philadelphia Inquirer. Yeah, these, the, this particular image was all over the place after Sandy. Here's some more from Union Beach. It looks a little bit like tornado damage almost. Here's a, a bird's eye view. Uh, in the book, I talk about this house here. A couple was staying here. They, were, they didn't wanna leave because they knew it would flood up to like this, the end of their street here, but they didn't ever experience any flooding past the driveway apron of their house. So they thought this would be fine. And they had one house across the street and then a couple down here. Well, they stayed and they soon realized their basement was going was filling up with water. It was going to compromise that the structure. So they evacuated to the garage apartment, which was on a slab. And they watched from up there as the, the bay, which looked like a raging ocean, by the way, um, slowly ripped apart the house across the street. Those people sought shelter in their Jeep Liberty in their driveway for the rest of the storm. And as you can see in this picture, the driveway stayed fine. Uh, they made it through the entire thing in their Jeep somehow, but the water went around them like an, like an island and it destroyed this couple's house. They watched as the, the bay took the door off, the front windows off, and then it, all their possessions were going out the back. And it was just little stuff at first. And then it was like the dryer and then it was the refrigerator. And then it was whole doors and walls. And they then the whole thing collapsed into the water. And uh, they were in the apartment next door. And then the apartment they watched underneath start to go. And they were in the apartment when the whole thing collapsed into the water. And they rode it like a boat. And they had to jump out with their huge Great Pyrenees dog and into the cold water, which there was about 12 feet. And they're in the water with the debris and debris hitting them and the dog is flailing and it's dragging the wife underwater and it's leashed and she won't let go of them. But the dog knows it's, pa it's panicking and the husband tells um, his wife, he says, you got to let her go. You know, you got to let the dog go. And she's like, no. And she almost drowns with this thing. Try you know, the dog doesn't know he's trying to like get protected by the, the mom. 
and it's she's she goes underwater and, and she comes up gasping he's like you have to let her go so she's shaking she unbuckles the, the leash and uh it's dark it's like getting dark and the, she just lets go and lets go with her dog and the dog drifts off behind debris and they don't even have time to grieve um they have to get to shelter because they're still in debris and they're running out of time because uh, it's getting the water's cold and uh they make it to their neighbor's house who had like a second floor deck and then the stairs are still there and they made it up there and, it, and the the couple was who was living there was home they thought they evacuated and one of them is a nurse the other one's a marine and they they rescue this nice couple and they treat the wife for hypothermia they ride out the storm there and wouldn't you know it as the storm is uh raging on there's barking outside the dog figured out which house they were in and was stuck on a piece on a pile of uh debris between this new house they're in and the house next door and it was fine and they and once the storm uh was over and the water receded they went and got her but to this day the dog will not go outside in the rain i got to meet the dog uh when i delivered the book to them uh i got to meet the dog because I interviewed them on the phone and what a sweetie pie, but she wouldn't, uh, she won't go out in the rain because would you, I guess after that, but the dog lived. So don't worry. I wasn't going to tell you any dead dog story. So I'm not mean, this is the side view of where, where I was just talking about. Okay. This was, this is their house. See the roof. And this is the apartment. And this is, uh, I believe it was uh, this house they escaped to. Like the, the apartment actually ran right into the deck where they needed to escape. Uh, even though they had jumped off that because they didn't think they'd live in that. And here's that neighbor and the, you can't really, I don't think the Jeep is there in this shot. I think they drove it out, but that's where they rode it out. All right, so other seasons, other storms. It's not just Sandy, you know, we're all fascinated with storms. Uh, sometimes storms create some pretty, pretty wacky weather. We had a Meteo tsunami in 2013 that was caused by a derecho, like a, a line of storms that lasts for hundreds of miles. One came through, it wasn't that bad, but what it, what it does is the pressure difference under these massive thunderstorms uh, versus the high pressure that is around before that. So that quick uh, barometric pressure change kind of pushes on the, on the uh, ocean surface. It creates like a ripple and sometimes, rarely, but sometimes if you're just in the right spot and one of these is big enough, it could create a tidal wave. And that's what happened in Barnegat Light in 2013. There were people fishing on the jetty there and this, the water level of the inland went down suddenly. And then that wave came in. It just happened to be the exact right angle with this uh, meteo tsunami. And it wiped, it like took out a father and son on the, on the jetty and, uh, they were okay, but uh, they had to go to the hospital. And they also caused some damage in Massachusetts where a, a, an in, a harbor was, ex or an inlet, I should say, was exactly the right angle on their side too. So you never know what kind of wacky weather we could get at the shore. We get water spouts as well. Uh, in 1999, 1999, we had a water spout come on land in Holgate, rip off the roof of the Sea, uh, a sea Spray Motel. Um, there, uh, Crazy stuff. All right, so it's a 2020 hurricane season and I can't say this year, you know, 2020 is nuts as it is. Like, so this is a perfect hurricane map for 2020 because it is all over the place. Uh, it does not follow any rules whatsoever. Um, the Gulf Coast had several impacts. We had impacts here. Um, it was a record year for uh, land falling storms. Uh, we had several, and I don't think Delta's on here, so it was even more after this graphic was made by NJNN. Uh, we were impacted by Faye and, of course, Isaiz, um down there. So it's not even over. We still have a few weeks left of, of hurricane season to go. Here's a nicer uh, look at Faye. And one more thing about Faye, and I, if, you, if you had me bet that this would ever happen. I would never take this bet, but Sandy, Irene, and Faye made landfall all in the same general area. That's three in less than 10 years. After 50 years of 
nothing to three in 10 years. That is just incredible odds in that one little area of the Jersey Shore. Um, so if you have real estate there, I'm sorry, I hope it don't cause that to all drop. <laughs> Everybody's good there though, don't worry. All right, guys, that's it. The shore and storms perfect together. Um, we, uh, our publisher would kill me if I didn't mention this, but you can get not only great storms at the Jersey shore, which you definitely need for your house. Okay. It's definitely got to get that. You can get 10% off by using the code summer on at down the shore publishing. If, if you don't want to do that, it's at Barnes and Noble. It's in most New Jersey Barnes and Noble stores. It's on Amazon and it's the winner of this year's uh, independent book publishers award Ben Franklin award as the best regional book in the country so get your award-winning book Scott, oh, yeah can I say something of course oh I want okay <laughs> if you get this book and have it in your house it's guaranteed to keep any storm away oh, look at so that. afraid of that book <laughs> <laughs> oh awesome job I'll clap on How we do with time? Now. Oh, three minutes over. I'm sorry. No, no, that was perfect. <laughs> Very good. I perfect. tried. That might be my, our best work yet. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. So For time-wise. Floor to some questions from our sure. audience. Uh, you are welcome, if you have a question, to unmute yourself and ask if you can figure out how to do that. Just remember, we are being recorded in case that gives anyone pause. And remember, I deal with 12 year olds all day, so no question's gonna be bad. <laughs> Anyone? Well, perhaps they're all looking for their mute button. So I'll ask a question in the meantime. Why do you think, you know, there's a lot of discussion about global warming and its impact on the shore. Do you think that has something to do with why we've had now these three storms kind of landing right in the spot you showed us on the map? Is it just a coincidence? Will we see more of these? Well, I think the landfall those three are a coincidence. I don't think that's like some special gateway. Uh, it just, I like to talk about it because it's just the odds are so crazy. If you look through history, maybe Margaret, you could back me up on this, but we do go periods of uh, more activity and then less activity and more activity. We seem to be in a much more active time period right now. And it yeah, there, does, historically speaking, there was a lot of activity as far back as the early part of the 19th century, another activity, highly act active period, oh, first 15 years of the 20th century. Except now it's just that we have so much property value at the shore that these things yeah. are big time news stories now because they wipe out billions of dollars in real estate at you know, one time. Somehow but I don't think the problem is the, the increase of hurricanes in terms of the uh, global climate change, it's the, the constant rising of the waters, the higher tides that I'm getting flooded around here. It's getting to be an ordinary thing now. Never used to see it at all, never. Yeah, I was gonna say that because now LBI, cause I'm, you know, I go down to Holgate all the time. The, it floods for, I mean, even when I was a kid, it flooded during a thunderstorm, but it went away. But now it, you have like road closures, they make you take ocean, drives and stuff like yeah. that yeah. it's 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 and like you said it's normal it's it's not supposed to be normal uh but it's becoming normal that that's the impact you got to watch out for and if you have a higher sea your storm surge is going to come in at a higher level so you have that impact too and then it comes up to storm drains yeah as my friend who lost his wife went to get a haircut and she went right through that like an area in beach haven destroyed her bmw oh really? <laughs> that hurts um, anyone else in the audience with a question? Uh, I do. Well, not exactly a question. Um, my parents had a home in Seaside Park in 1962, and um, I was very much fascinated with that storm also. And I actually put together a scrapbook of clippings from the newspapers, um, and I still have it. So <laughs> I always wonder, well, what am I going to do with it? But I do still have it. And then fast forward to 2012, and my mother-in-law lived in Ortley Beach, which as you know, got completely devastated. Her house had to be torn down. She's 90 years old now. And uh, she rebuilt a four bedroom <laughs> up eight feet off the ground. So- oh, um, She's still there? But Ortley is not the same. It definitely, uh, it used to be a lot of little cottages 
and now it's a big, like you said, big tall houses with a few exceptions that people just rehab their little, little cottage. But Virginia, uh, can she yes. hear? Yeah, you can, we can hear you, Margaret. Yes, uh, Virginia, the way this storm book originally got started back in the very early 90s was because of a scrapbook that a woman had kept of storms from about 1900 to 1940. And she wow. brought that into my office. So Look. what you should do with that scrapbook is you should give it to the Ocean County Historical Society. I think I will. I mean, uh, we still go to Ortley all the time. We're going this weekend. Or even so. an even a Ortley Historical Society. Yes, I do have, have one now too. Yeah. 40 years ago, somebody will want to research that. Okay. I, in fact, I showed it to somebody from the, um, the National Weather Service who came to speak at where I worked. And um, he said, why didn't you become a weatherman <laughs> or weather person? <laughs> I said, well, women didn't do it so much back when I was young. <laughs> but uh, always an interest in weather. Oh, I love that you did that. That's awesome. Yes, and, uh, and Margaret, thank you for the suggestion. I, I was making a little note here to tell Virginia that we would be happy to give that a safe home when she's ready to. Oh, that's great. Let it go. That's great. <laughs> and somebody someday is going to make a third edition of Great Storms, and they're going to want that kind of information. Right. So, yeah, um, I had that uh, book to show too. You know, that's kind of tucked in there. So. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Not that many of them out there, so that's that's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks, thank Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience. I'm not going to let you off that easy. So I'll ask one last question. <laughs> We're talking about risk versus reward, right? So there's this pattern of storms coming and devastating the coast and we keep going back, you know? Um, is it foolhardy at yeah. some point to keep building there? Is there a portion of the shore that we should cede and say that it's, you know, not- It may come to that someday. It may come to the point where people- close off certain parts and say no more. But what Stu Farrell from uh, Stockton, who does be beach uh, profiles, what he told me when I asked him that question, he said, it'll change when the money runs out. As long as insurance and the federal yeah. government are rebuilding yeah. the beach, yeah. why would people stop coming? You yeah. know, so it's all about money. a storm like 90, like 62 or Sandy and people can't rebuild, then the land will stay clear. I thought there was going to be a more like a uh, fewer <laughs> houses being built after Sandy and then not only did they come back they came back bigger yeah. like you go down to Holgate it's like driving through a canyon now it's yeah. kind of it's a little off-putting but I mean if I was a millionaire and had one of those houses I'd be happy I guess <laughs> but you know it, how long how much bigger can they get I don't know um, they all have breakaway walls now I imagine someday the Jersey Shore is going to be like a whole bunch of piles sticking out of the ocean somewhere like down the road but as long as there's uh, money fixing it, you're, it's not going to stop because, like I said before, the number of days we have that are great and the memories we're making and the generational aspect, you know, parents and kids, and then they grow up and that, their kids come. As long as that's keep, that keeps happening, the Jersey Shore is going to be alive and well, not to mention it's a huge part of our economy. We have a uh, very good afterward written by Gil Gall about the changing oh, yeah. climate. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner from the Post in Philadelphia Inquirer. Yes, so, I know him. He was a neighbor. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 yeah, he did the afterward and it talks all about that. He doesn't get emotional <laughs> like us. He tells it like it is. He's just like, <laughs> 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 all yeah, right. Do I have a last question? If not, we will wrap up. All right, well, I will applaud on behalf of everyone once again. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you very Bye. much. For yes, thank you for having us. Yeah. Sharing your years of expertise and your passion with us. I encourage everyone to go and get the book. You'll want to have that to refer to again and again. Those photos are just amazing. That you want um, from all your family members. Yeah, Christmas is coming, right? <laughs> one for each. If you sell enough books, Scott, you can get one of those mansions on the shore, right? Oh, uh, no, I wish no, that was the case. No. Not, not a, <laughs> Uh, so I can rent one, everyone. maybe. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Again, as I noted at the start of our talk, if you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you'll be up to date on all of our next events. Our next 
In this online speaker series is local attorney William Hunnicky, who will be sharing pieces of political memorabilia dating back to 1840. So very timely, his talk will be on November 15th at 2 p.m. So find us on social media, visit our website, www.oceancountyhistory.org, and consider becoming a member. Uh, your membership funds uh, not only get you some benefits like discounted attendance at some events and uh, advance notice of different events, uh, but you also help us in our mission telling the stories of Ocean County. So consider getting involved. And we're always looking for volunteers too. So please reach out. All right, with that, we'll call it a day. Thank you again, Scott and Mark. Thank you guys. Thank you. Anytime. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.